All right, so here we are. We're going to go through part two, which is I'm calling it disorders of hepatic and biliary function or hepatobiliary function. In part one, we talked about the intestines, intestinal disorders, diseases, Crohn's disease. Uh, we talked about some intestinal blockage kinds of disorders, things like that. Now we're going to focus on the, um, the accessory organs like the gallbladder, the liver, and the pancreas. So that's mainly what we're going to talk about here. So even though food doesn't go through them like it does through the esophagus, stomach, and the intestines, so food doesn't go through the liver, gallbladder, and pancreas, but they do kind of squirt things in there like the liver makes bile, the gallbladder squirts the bile into the small intestine, the pancreas also makes a bunch of uh, digestive enzymes. So we're going to start kind of, we're going to kind of move in that direction. So remember when we were talking about the intestines and absorption of nutrients takes place in the intestine. So it's breaking down, digesting food, and then that food is being absorbed. Now, there are a lot of nutrients, amino acids, uh, all of our all of our basic nutrients that we think of, the carbohydrates, fats, kind of maybe, maybe tend to move toward the... Uh, the lacteals or the lymph system, but but these things are absorbed, and a lot of them are absorbed right into the blood. And one of the problems is that something else that could be absorbed would be like toxins, so something maybe that your body doesn't really want to have in circulation. So we have this really great system. It's called portal circulation, or the portal the portal vein system, and what happens is that nutrients or toxins that are absorbed kind of have this direct route to the liver. Okay, so that's kind of kind of handy. So that way the liver can kind of have a good look at it first, maybe take care of some of the some of the glucose that's being absorbed and and manage that stuff. So uh, it's kind of a kind of a handy system. Some, some things can uh, can break down with it though, like portal hypertension that we'll that we'll talk about. So let's talk about first uh, what's going on in the liver. So here you can see that nutrients or toxins, same for both of these, can either come in through the hepatic the portal vein or it can it can go in through the hepatic artery. So so you have blood blood flowing through the kit through the liver from you know the stuff that's just coming from the intestine stomach, you know, even the esophagus is is uh, has blood flow from it. And that's moving into the liver and then you also have just general circulation blood that's moving into the liver. And what it does is it kind of mixes here. So you can see you can see here's here's blood coming from the arteries and then blood coming from that hepatic portal vein and it mixes and then it just kind of runs along this little sinusoid and and exposes all of that blood to all these hepatocytes. So you can see these these hepatic cells all along here that are just kind of like sentries. They're just kind of sort of guarding. I don't know if that's that's kind of a weird word to use, but they have enzymes. They contain enzymes. They have receptors for um, uh, channels, things like that, glucose channels, and and so they also the liver has a lot of uh, a lot of enzymes, that, which I already said, that are going that can potentially break down toxins. In, in, I mean, even drugs sometimes. So we kind of have to expect this with certain drugs that they're going to be broken down by these cells. So it's kind of a cool system. Um, and on the other side, so if you look at if we kind of look at one of these, you actually have to look at this. So if you look at one of these cells, then you can see that kind of on one side you've got blood access to the blood. And then on the other side, you have the bile, and the bile is bile canaliculi, canals, that, that are going to drain into the bile duct to be excreted. Okay? So you've got stuff coming in, and then you have the, the, uh, the stuff moving out. Now remember, the liver does a lot of things, and one of the things it makes are bile salts. So this is how the bile salts get into the bile. It makes bile salts and bile. And so this is how the bile is produced, and so that's going to drain into the bile duct. Okay. So remember, it's also doing things like making, um, it's making albumin, it's making clotting factors. So all these little cells are really busy doing a lot of stuff with this blood that comes by, and then the blood will leave the hepatic vein, vein go back to the heart, and then out to general circulation. Okay. So, uh, so blood from the hepatic portal vein and the hepatic artery mix in the sinusoids. And then the hepatic cells lie along these sinusoids, pick up chemicals from the blood, modify that the whatever's in there, 
um, and then they come back together to empty into the, uh, the central vein. So while the sinusoids empty into the central veins, the on the back is the uh, the bile bile is produced on the other side. Bile is produced and released into the uh, into the main bile duct ultimately. Okay. Hope that made sense. So metabolic functions of the liver. What are, what are all the things that they do? Well, carbohydrates. They deal with carb carbohydrates. They can make make proteins. Well, lots of cells can make proteins, obviously, but uh, they can actually make amino acids. They can they can change amino acids uh, from uh, one type to another. Uh, they metabolize lipids and uh, and they you know they'll produce LDLs and and send those out to uh, to provide cholesterol. So they're they're making cholesterol as well. So glucose is stored as glycogen, converted to glucose, used to make fats, formed from amino acids, other substrates. So all the stuff we've we've talked about that liver cells can do. So this is kind of more of a reminder. Lipids oxidize for energy, synthesize, packaged into those lipoproteins that I just mentioned. Proteins can be synthesized from amino acids, transamination, deamination. So that means uh, turning ammonia, which is toxic. So when you break down a, a protein, you're removing a mean group from it, and that amine group can be, uh, or, or well, you can it pr it produces ammonia, which is an NH3, and then and then that can uh, be be further metabolized into urea, which is harmless. Now, ammonia, if ammonia gets out into systemic circulation at at high high levels, then that can actually cause some harm to the brain, some encephalopathy of the brain. So we don't want that to happen. So it's good when our liver functions good well. So portal hypertension, if some kind of, so during liver failure, that's, that's an example, during liver failure, you can, the blood flow from that portal system that's supposed to be leaving all of these digestive organs, the intestines, those kinds of things, and supposed to be going to the liver. Well, if it's not able to make it to the liver, if there's some kind of backup, then the pressure in that system will increase. And, um, and that's what we call portal hypertension. So that's increased resistance to flow in that portal venous system. And it affects veins draining into the port, into the, uh, well, okay, affects veins draining into the hepatic portal system, which is what I just said. So various causes, it can be either uh, before the before the liver, in the liver, after the liver. We saw the same kinds of things with, uh, with the kidneys, but I'm not going to go into a lot of uh, details with those. But it's the same concept as we had, you know, intrarenal, postrenal, prerenal. So pressure in the portal veins increases and varicosities. So varicosities can be this uh, distension of veins, which we kind of see here, and that's caused by this back pressure. This back pressure kind of causes blood to collect in these in these veins in the intestinal organs. So I think this is showing, yeah, this is showing the esophagus. So it's backed up into the esophagus, and then we can see something called a esophageal varices or varices, esophageal varices. So varicosity shunts develop. Shunts may be, uh, this is interesting. If you think about what's going on here, if blood is backing up, so remember this portal system is kind of there to get these chemicals, these nutrients, toxins, whatever these chemicals are, get them to the liver so the liver can, can kind of process them first. If it backs up, then what happens is shunts may develop and it may go directly from this portal system directly into general circulation with that. So it's going to bypass the liver is what's going to happen. So as these things are absorbed, it can just go straight into uh, general circulation. And that can cause problems. And you're going to, and you can see, you know, an increase in, in levels of certain, certain chemicals. Um, so if we, if we look at this picture up here, so portal hypertension, increased pressure in uh, peritoneal cavities. Now the peritoneum, we haven't talked about ascites yet, but we will. When you have increased pressure in the vessels and the capillaries in the peritoneal cavity, then fluid can collect in the peritoneal cavity, and that's, that's called ascites. When, uh, when fluid collects in a, uh, in a compartment like that. Uh, portal systemic shunting of blood. That's what I was just mentioning, that, that blood can move directly from the portal system into regular, regular cir general circulation into the, um, into the, uh, 
uh, arteries. So shunting of ammonia and toxins from the intestine directly into general circulation, which can lead to hepatic encephalopathy. Okay, so if the liver isn't able to detoxify that ammonia, then then it can uh, it can cause some cause some damage. So collateral channels. Um, Esophageal varices, we, we mentioned those, that's where you generally tend to see it. Hemorrhoids can develop as well when that, when that backs up because it goes all the way along the intestinal tract, which includes, which includes the, uh, the anal region. Um, splenomegaly, they, so if we, if we want to jump back here real quick, you can see that one of the places that blood was draining is from the spleen, okay, and that's that makes sense because remember red blood cells are breaking down in the spleen, and so we want to get that heme, that, that uh, bilirubin that's produced from the breakdown of these red blood cells, we want to get that to the liver as quickly as possible. So in this case, we have splenomegaly, so enlargement of the spleen that can happen, uh, which can lead to other problems, anemia, leukopenia, thrombocytopenia, and, uh, and bleeding. Okay, so these varices that we were talking about. So that's obstruction in, the, in flow of that portal circulation with portal hypertension, diversion of blood flow to other venous channels, including the gastric and esophageal veins. So now instead of blood moving nicely to the liver, it's kind of backing up and it's moving into, in this case, one of the, one of the main areas that this is seen is in the esophagus. And so you can see these, these varices that develop this distension. That, that takes place in the, and increased blood in these in these other areas. So, um, so yeah, that's what that's what we're talking about. And there's the the hemorrhoidal varices that can that can happen down here in the uh, in the anal region as well. So ascites. So that's what I was mentioning earlier. It's accumulation of fluid in that peritoneal cavity. Remember, the peritoneal cavity is what's kind of containing most of the most of your guts. It's got most of your uh, large, small intestine in it. There, there are some that kind of move a little bit retroperitoneal behind the peritoneal cavity. Your kidneys are back there too, but most of it is contained in this cavity called we call the peritoneal cavity. And when you have fluid, so so ascites is when fluid starts to collect in there. So most common cause is cirrhosis, so the liver is not, is not handling fluid well or fluid is not moving into the liver the way that it's supposed to and so it starts to move into those capillaries and it can, and it can, uh, can leak out, I guess, into the, uh, into, the peritoneal, into the peritoneal cavity. So portal hypertension can cause that. Decreased synthesis of albumin by the liver. Now this is that, that same concept of capillary colloidal or osmotic or oncotic pressure where you don't have as many particles in the vessels in your capillaries and so what tends to happen is because you're not making albumin you don't have as many you don't have the osmotic pull to keep it in the capillary so that fluid starts to move out and when that fluid starts to move out it's it can cause edema systemic edema but it can also cause in this case we're talking about ascites we're talking about accumulation of fluid in that in that peritoneal cavity okay and uh, renal and sodium renal sodium and water retention so a lot of times um, when fluid is moving out of these vessels the body might misinterpret that as lower blood flow and so the the kidneys will instead of saying oh no we need to keep fluid in there it, they aren't going to, and the and the the uh, the kidneys are going to try to reabsorb more water to try to keep keep as much fluid in the body as it as it can because it thinks maybe that there isn't enough. So it's kind of a um, kind of a tricky tricky kind of a thing there because the kidneys will actually a lot of times reabsorb more water when they aren't getting blood flow. But if they don't know that they don't know the reason for the lower blood flow. And in this case, it's because fluid is moving out of the capillaries and collecting in, uh, in certain compartments, in this case, the peritoneal cavity. So ascites, 25% mortality in one year if it's associated with cirrhosis. So cirrhosis is, uh, is pretty, pretty deadly. Causes abdominal distension, increased abdominal girth and weight gain. So here you can see this belly, this isn't a beer belly, this is a, well, it's pretty much a water belly, or at least a, an exudate belly, and it's fluid that's moving out and collecting in this, in this area. It's not, in this case, it's not fat. Now, there could be fat involved. That's a, that would be a different thing. Um, but yeah, it's that, it's that fluid movement out. Okay, 
Um, jaundice. Jaundice is something else. So remember, we had the breakdown of red blood cells that happens primarily in the spleen, and then the spleen produces this unconjugated, unconjugated uh, bilirubin, and then that unconjugated bilirubin moves to, I'll go this way, to the liver, where it is conjugated, and then moves out in the bile. So if the liver is not doing its job or for whatever reason this circula circulation is clogged from the spleen to the liver, then you can have a buildup of this unconjugated bilirubin in the body and that's what we call jaundice. So I think we've been over this before so uh, we'll, we'll kind of move past that. So inflammation, inflammation always has this ending of itis and so hepatitis is inflammation of the liver. Now most of us have heard of hepatitis. We usually think of viral hepatitis, but hepatitis isn't just isn't restricted to just being viral hepatitis. There are lots of things that can cause hepatitis or this inflammation of the liver. So reaction to chemical agents, alcohol, drugs, other toxins, and autoimmune disorders can cause inflammation to occur in the liver. Uh, infectious agents, mononucleosis, salmonellosis, amine amoebiasis. These things also are all things that can cause inflammation of the liver, so that would be classified as a type of hepatitis. Now, the most common is going to be, at least worldwide, is going to be uh, viral hepatitis, and about 15,000 deaths annually, it, just in the United States, and many, many, many more when you consider you know, the global impact. So viral hepatitis varies in modes of transmission, incubation, period, degree, and dam of damage, and chronicity. So we're going to come back and we're going to talk about all of the hepatitis, the viral hepatitis diseases. But first, we are going to go over the non-viral. So the non-viral hepatitis, because I don't want to, uh, because these are these are important, and as we go through them, you'll you'll uh, hopefully realize that. So. There's something called autoimmune hepatitis. This we don't know what causes it, but for whatever reason, your immune system causes is causing inflammatory processes to happen in the liver. So there could be uh, there could be a number of things that that do cause it, but when you're talking about your immune system, it tends to be chronic. It tends to be progressive, and uh, and so that's that's uh, that's something to think about is is your immune system. Now there's something else called acute fulminant hepatitis. Now maybe when when I think of acute fulminant hepatitis, I think of Tylenol, okay, which is down here. So acute fulminant that just means that it, it happens very very quickly, and it doesn't. It's not just that it happens quickly. It happens quickly, and it's and it tends to become very severe quickly. So. Let's just kind of read what it says here as a definition. So hepatic failure due to hepatitis of all types that progresses to hepatic encephalopathy. Okay, so this is this is where you have um, such severe kidney or liver liver impairment that it can result in mental confusion or coma. Uh, a lot of times this could be because of the buildup of ammonia that that could be causing that. Uh, but it happens within two to three weeks in persons without chronic liver disease because we're talking about acute. And sometimes it can happen a whole lot faster than that. So the number one cause in the United States is Tylenol. So Tylenol has a, uh, so it's got a like a two-step process to, um, to detoxify it. So the liver is responsible for, you know, you put Tylenol in, your liver doesn't know that it's a medication, it sees it as a toxin, it sees it as a chemical that shouldn't be there. So it tries to break it down. Well, this first, this first step is, this is supposed to be a skull and crossbones. Okay, so this first step is a, is a toxic agent. Okay, and then it very quickly will turn it into something non-toxic. Okay, so as long as you have a normal dose or even a little bit of a high dose, your liver has no problem with it at all. But it's just when you take too much of it. Um, oops, I was going to write Tylenol there, not toxic. So as long as, but if you take too much of it, then you can, then it can result in hepatitis or kidney or liver damage. I'm not sure why I keep doing that, but it can re result in liver damage or this acute fulminant hepatitis. So we'll talk. Let's let's kind of go through that again. I know I just kind of went went over it, but we're going to go over it again. 
But the liver, I guess not right now, but in a minute. So the liver metabolizes lipid-soluble substance that cannot be directly excreted by the kidney. So the kidney is what gets rid of a lot of these, these toxins. It's the job of the liver, primarily, to detoxify them, put them in a soluble form, and so they can be excreted by the kidney in the urine. So that's, that's a more efficient way of getting rid of it. The liver has to put it in the bile, which goes to the gallbladder, and then it's excreted into the, um, into the intestine. But the kidney, the kidney is going through fluid all day, and I mean, we're, we're urinating a lot. So it's, a, it's an efficient way to do it, but the liver has to first detoxify it, make it, make it non-toxic. So it does this, you know, couple of steps, I guess. Phase one, it breaks it down. So whatever, whatever this molecule was, breaks it down. There are enzymes in there. They're called the, uh, the SIP, uh, cytochrome P450s. And there are a lot of different SIPs, SIP, SIP2A, SIP3B. There are a lot of different cytochrome P450 enzymes that do like a little thing. They decarboxylate it or they dehydrogenate it. So they, they'll take off, you know, a some certain moiety of the of the chemical, and then that might that might be enough. It might detoxify. It may take a couple of passes through. So phase two, it couples with couples it with the substance to make to make it more water soluble. So it's going to make it more water water soluble in some way. Otherwise, it's going to have to leave in the bile. So another thing that the liver does, it inactivates hormones, insulin, glucagon, thyroxine, steroid hormones. So it can. Uh, so it can inactivate those. You don't, you know, you don't want insulin just sort of floating around in your body forever. You release it once and there it is for the rest of your life. You don't want that. So it's the, the job of the liver to kind of say, okay, thanks for your service and then, and then take it down. So um, here we go. This is what I was going to, this is what I started to explain earlier. But in this case with acute fulminant, hepatitis. In the case of acetaminophen, the liver breaks it down, leaving only a small amount of a toxic residue that can then become, be combined with another molecule called glutathione and then excreted. Okay, so, so it's, it does, but it does have this little middle ground of a toxic residue that doesn't last very long. And in a healthy person, it's not even, not even noticed. It's, it's, a, uh, it's a fine way to do things. It's just that when you overdose, on acetaminophen, then it can be it can be toxic. And speaking of toxic, another another type of hepatitis here we see in the middle, alcoholic hepatitis. It's another type of inflammation that can occur in the liver from overuse of alcohol. So toxicity and free radical production leads to cell injury, inflammation, and oxidative stress. So too much alcohol, your liver has to break down and deal with this alcohol. And in order to do that, it's kind of, it's similar to what happens with, with the Tylenol. So you have, you have your alcohol and then it's converted to something called acetaldehyde, acetaldehyde. And then that's, um, I think, turned into just some kind of a harmless acetate. Okay, so so this is this is fine, but this one is uh, is bad. This acetaldehyde, and that's actually what's responsible for some of the sickness, the flushing, uh, you know, turning red with with alcohol use. A lot of this is this acetaldehyde. Well, in order to break this down, to break alcohol down, it needs this molecule called NAD, okay, which is a, a member of the B, B, B vitamins, I believe. And, uh, but it needs this NAD molecule. Now here's the thing. This NAD molecule is also needed for fatty acid uh, synthesis. Okay? So it's also needed to handle fat and deal with triglycerides. So there are triglycerides in there. And now you've put alcohol in there and it's saying, okay, wait a minute, I only have so much of this NAD. So either I'm going to detoxify this toxin called alcohol or I'm going to deal with the fat. And in this case, it's not a very difficult decision. Actually, I don't know if it is a decision. It's probably trying to do both. But, but, it, um, but because it's spending some of this NAD, trying to break down alcohol, what happens is a buildup of fat. The fat's going to have to wait to be, to be synthesized and to be, or for the fatty acids to be synthesized from the triglycerides. So it's going to have to wait uh, for that process to happen. And so fat will build up in the liver. And it develops, it builds up 
in a lot of places, but, but it, it builds up in the liver more quickly because the liver is supposed to be dealing with it first. Okay, so what ends up happening is you get something called steatosis or fatty liver. So we hear about, you know, people who over drink alcohol, they will just develop fatty liver. Now it's not progressed to the point of hepatitis yet, but it is a buildup of fat. So liver, tell, liver cells will then contain fat droplets, the liver becomes enlarged, and it's asymptomatic for the most part and resolves after alcohol intake discontinues. So, so that's a, uh, a case of, um, of just sort of what happens when, you're, when your liver has to, deal with, has to deal with alcohol. Now that can progress and uh, become alcoholic hepatitis, and that's just some, at some point the, uh, it moves on to this inflammatory stage. So liver inflammation, so the liver cells aren't able to keep up, they become toxic and that's going to come back to the toxicity free radical production. It tries to keep up the best it can, but then at some point it fails and then you develop something called alcoholic hepatitis. Um, so it says here common in binge drinkers, rapid onset jaundice. This would have to be fairly chronic though. Uh, rapid onset jaundice. So, so now we have the liver cells that aren't the liver cells aren't functioning for more than just fat. It's uh, they're having a hard time keeping up in general. Now, if this goes on, so we can have liver cell failure. So we can have damage to the liver. And when you have continuous damage to the liver and to parts of the liver and to the hepatocytes, then what happens is in the repair process, some of that normal material, some of that healthy material will be replaced, be replaced with scar tissue. Okay? And when that happens to a large degree, then we call that cirrhosis. That's cirrhosis of the liver. So that's scar tissue and it's partially blocking. Remember those, those tubes, those sinusoids where the, the blood was flowing between the, um, between the liver cells? Well, you know, if you have scar tissue and those things get blocked, that's going to decrease the function of your liver overall. The liver tends to get larger, it's more disorganized, and it's, it just becomes less and less functional. Okay, so that's uh, cirrhosis is the end stage uh, of, of liver disease. That's when your liver is kind of, kind of just giving out. It's, it's just gotten this continuous damage for whatever reason, and it, and it just can't, can't do it anymore. So um, now we've talked about fatty buildup, fatty liver in terms of alcohol, but you know you can have buildup of fats without alcohol. So steatosis, which is which is just fatty infiltrates, but steatohepatitis, fatty infiltrates with inflammation and hepatocyte necrosis. So. Without alcohol, obesity, this can happen with obesity. That might be just be too, too many adipocytes or too many uh, triglycerides for the liver to deal with, and so it starts to build up. Uh, type 2 diabetes, it's associated with that. Metabolic syndrome, which a lot of times involves, you know, higher, higher demand on the liver anyway because you've got, you know, increased cholesterol, increased triglycerides, you've got a lot, a lot more fat to deal with. So hyperlipidemia in general, so increased uh, lipids in the blood in general can cause fatty liver even without, even without the, uh, the assault of, uh, of heavy, heavy drinking. Okay, so this, this picture is kind of cool. It shows the healthy liver, fatty liver, and then some fibrosis that's taking place, and then that ultimately will uh, we'll move on to cirrhosis. But, but this hepatitis doesn't show hepatitis directly in this picture. It will in the next one or in one coming up. Uh, but the steatohepatitis is, uh, is when inflammation starts to, starts to occur. So fatty infiltrates, then hepatitis, and then, uh, and then like we said in the last slide, it can move on to fibrous formation and cirrhosis. Okay, so those were the non-viral hepatitises. So now let's talk about viral hepatitis. Now there, this is a pretty pretty handy chart. I don't know. I could probably put more information on there um, because we know a little bit more than this. But this kind of gives you a, a nice little snapshot. So there are five different viral hepatitises. So there's um, there's uh, Hep A, Hep B, Hep C, Hep D, Hep E, Hepatitis A, Hepatitis B, etc. So uh, we'll go through each one of these quickly. I'm not. I've got in parentheses here the the actual virus, the type of virus that that has an effect. I'm not personally too too worried about that uh, category. 
um, because it's not it's not going to help us in in what we're what we're talking about. But so, but these are things that you really need to keep straight. So, really, it comes down to you should know whether it's acute or whether it's chronic or whether it can be both, and then how it's transmitted. Very important how it's transmitted. So, Hep A, it's usually benign, self-limiting. There's no chronic infection. So this is a hepatitis, but it's a disease that you get. So it's normally fecal oral. So I think of dirty water, poor sanitation. So that means that people are drinking and the sewage and the drinking water is somehow mixing or just general poor sanitation in general, or yeah, in general, generally. And, uh, and so that can cause, that's what's going to spread it, okay? So, so we think of acute, we think of you get sick, you get, you know, you get the hepatitis, you get sick, you get over it, and then you have antibodies against it. And uh, so people living in these areas will have antibodies against it generally, but if you're going to go to one of these areas, then you would probably want to be vaccinated, and that's an important point here. A vaccine is available for this, okay? Uh, hep B, Hep B can be either acute or chronic, and can in the chronic phase will lead to cirrhosis or can lead to cirrhosis, liver cancer, and so the liver cancer. I'm going to say this now. I'll say it again. But the liver cancer is really a lot of times dependent on co-infection with Hep D, which is down here. Okay, so now you can have Hep B without Hep D. Now, you generally don't have Hep D without Hep B, though. So that virus, what they found out is that when liver cancer developed, that a lot of the virus that, that the person was infected with, if they, if they had Hep B and then they got cancer, they noticed that in a lot of those cases, they were co-infected with Hep D. So they think that Hep D has some kind of influence on developing cancer. Uh, with a Hep B hepatitis infection. I hope that makes sense. So how is it transmitted? Print, uh, parenteral, parenteral, not, which means that it's not GI related. So, uh, so that's going to be different from the fecal oral route, which is GI related. So that means that infected blood, um, infected blood or serum, oral or sexual contact, which is most common mother to infant can can occur. So Hep B is one of the, uh, B for birth is one of the viruses that are given to babies when they're first born um, because it, because it can, it, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty common uh, to, to be found in, in hospital settings. So, um, or people may not know that they're carriers. Okay. So that's the other thing is, is people can be carriers and then they give it to the baby and then there, now the baby has it too. So uh, a lot of times they just uh, usually vaccinate the baby as soon as as soon as it's born, so then it doesn't get Hep B. And there is obviously then these things are kind of tying together. There is a vaccine available for it. Hep C, uh, we kind of think of this as blood to blood. Uh, it can also be sexual contact. Can also can also spread it. But this is chronic. Okay, C for chronic. So we have A for acute, B for both acute or chronic, and C for chronic. Isn't that nice? Okay, so um, so it's often asymptomatic early, but causes chronic hepatitis and possibly cirrhosis and also possibly liver cancer. Okay, so you can be a carrier. Uh, you can have, you can not show, show symptoms. You have exacerbations and then you have uh, where it, where it kind of hides for a little while. Uh, but, but you can still, you can still be a, uh, you can still carry it. You can still uh, infect someone else. So no vaccine is available. That's not exactly true. They are well on their way to developing a, a vaccination vaccine for, for hep C. I don't think it's quite out and about and uh, and common yet. So, uh, but but there are uh, some vaccines, a vaccine available. It's just not it's just not commonly commonly done. It's not a scheduled vaccine at this point. So, and treatments treatments for it are, are becoming available because it's kind of a it's it kind of shows up. This is this is one that you see a lot of times in um, 
in IV drug users. Okay, so that's why blood to blood was mentioned there. And then we have, so hep D, and remember hep D kind of goes with hep B. So it, it requires, so you, you can't have hep D without having hep B. So it requires hep B to propagate. So, and when the hep B is, so you can have hep B without hep D, but you can't have hep D without hep B. I've said that before. But co-infection, when, when hep D does infiltrate the, uh, the hep B vaccination, then that's what I mentioned earlier, can increase the risk of liver cancer. So it has a similar transmission of, uh, as, as hepatitis B, which is, uh, which is just not GI. Okay, so it, so it doesn't, it can't be transmitted through, from GI, but it can be infected. It can be transmitted through blood, uh, sexual contact, um, that kind of thing. All right, so, and then the last one here is hep E, and I think of E can cause acute and self-limiting inf infection with low mortality. It's, so it's mainly really acute, okay, but it can be chronic in uh, someone with, who is immunocompromised, okay, so that's something to kind of keep in mind, but primarily it's it's an acute it's an acute virus and just like hep a it is mainly fecal oral and therefore associated with sanitation so sanitation contaminated water and uh, it's really uncommon in in developed regions so you you won't see this one as much unless you unless you travel to really really cool places okay um, so I'm gonna try to go through this quickly so the hep a sequence now I'm going to read through this. So 25 to 30 day incubation periods. That means your date of infection to where you um, where you either become uh, contagious or start showing symptoms is about just a month, just under a month. So fecal shedding occurs after the virus replicates in the liver and is excreted in the bile. So fecal shedding can occur, and that's, let's see, if we look over here... Um, I guess I don't I don't see it on this on this graph, but it but it but the fecal shedding means that you're spreading it and you're spreading it before symptoms occur. So shedding is followed by the presence of virus in the bloodstream, and then you can see the virus, and that's what that's what we see here. Okay, there's there's fecal. So uh, so then you can see the virus in the bloodstream, and uh, so that means you can you can measure it, and then you start developing antibodies to it after that. So as soon as you see it in the blood, which is called vi viremia. Okay, emia meaning in the blood, so that means virus in the blood. Then, then you start developing antibodies. You develop IgM first, and then and then Ig IgG. So, uh, so that's that that fecal spreading. So contagious, and then and then you start to uh, you start to form antibodies, and then and then it usually will resolve, and the body can the body can kind of fight that one off. Hep B sequence incubation period is a lot longer, one and a half to four months, and it's a more serious health problem worldwide. So a third of the world has been infected. So again, when we talk about when we talk about vaccinating newborns, this is one of the reasons because it is prevalent and it can be um, it can be chronic. Okay, so so we want to kind of be careful with that. So three specific antigens. All this is doing is it's kind of kind of pointing out the the different proteins that exist because the the sequence. Now I don't expect you to memorize every every part of the sequence, but what tends to happen is that we have this antigen that's on that's in the envelope, and that's the first thing that we're going to see when someone has been infected. That might be what we want to look at. It's this outer envelope tends to be the first thing that we see in the, um, in the, uh, in the blood. Okay, so that can happen after, you know, four or five weeks, however long it takes. And, uh, and so we see that and we say, okay, yeah, they've been, they've been uh, infected. And then right after that, you start forming antibodies uh, to, to the, uh, so then you you start forming you start forming antibodies to it. So this HBS antigen is the is the first thing that, that you can see, and then you can kind of kind of measure to see if the virus is there, and then you can start looking for anti uh, 
antibodies later. And so the HBC, HBE, these are kind of contained inside the, the virus, the outer coat or the outer envelope. And so these kind of show up a little bit later. Okay. So I think I circled that earlier when I meant the HBS here. All right, so HBS antigen is the earliest to appear and the most routinely measured. I have that underlined, so remember that. It's that outer coat or that outer envelope. Uh, the anti-HBS appears after clearance of HBS antigen and after hep B immunization. So we, we do see the, uh, the HBS uh, antibody. So we can see that in someone. We should be able to see that in the titer of someone who has been vaccinated. Okay, so presence of HBE antigen indicates the virus is replicating. That's that center one, okay? So that's this one down in here that's kind of surrounded by that envelope, but when you start to see that, then that means that replication is happening. So that means that you're producing more of these proteins. These proteins get out into the cell before it can build a new virus. And so we can start seeing and say, aha, okay, you're making more of these of these viruses. It's replicating, which which is uh, not, not a good thing. Okay, hep C, hepatitis C, incubation two to 26 weeks. That's, that's quite a range. Um, now, the thing to... I guess the things that stick out to me as being important is that yeah you can see the antibody and and you can kind of you can kind of measure the antibody it shows up in about three months anti HCV antibody you can actually look at the RNA as early as a month so you can detect it then if you if you specifically look for the RNA but then after yeah after a few months you can start seeing the antibody itself now. The thing that a lot of times we're interested in, though, is this alanine aminotransferase here. This enzyme, it's a liver enzyme. It's supposed to only be in the liver. And so when you start seeing this enzyme show up in the blood, what that means is that the hepatocytes where it was are being broken, okay? And it's releasing that enzyme into the blood and that's an indication that it's uh, it's that it's that it's actively actively causing problems. Okay, so it's it's an indication, obviously, that it's breaking uh, hepatocytes. It's breaking liver cells. So you've got your your disease is in a probably in an exacerbation phase. Okay, so uh, and that's that's uh, I didn't really mention that, but exacerbations and remissions of clinical symptoms are are that that happens. So you go for a while where you don't really see anything and then it and then it exacerbates and it gets worse for a while. And so we monitor that by looking at the ALT enzyme and you can see it goes up with initial exposure very high and then it kind of goes up and down and up and down, okay? All along. And so that's what that's kind of what you're going to monitor. So you can see it's a, every every couple of years or so. I'm sure it's different for for different people. Um, but it's going to continue to cause damage over these years and uh, and ultimately can can result in cirrhosis, liver cancer, or, or something like that. Um, so chronic, chronic viral hepatitis is, is uh, you know, we've mentioned some of these can be acute, some of these can be chronic, but it's the chronic hepatitises that are the principal cause of liver disease, cirrhosis, and liver cancer in the world. So these are the these are the main causes of liver liver cancer uh, in the world is the, are, are when these are these chronic hepatitises. So they're the chief re reason for liver transplants in adults um, and then this list the H HBV or hepatitis B, hepatitis C, hepatitis D are the chronic ones and remember B for both so B can either be acute or it can be chronic and C is chronic. Okay. And D, remember D is associated with B, the chronic form of, of B. So, uh, see? So easy. All right, so um, cirrhosis. Cirrhosis is, well, okay, so represents the end stage of chronic liver disease. So your liver has gone to the point that it is now, I, I like this picture, it's very dramatic and really clearly brings out differences. I don't know if it's, you know, I haven't looked at a bunch of liver 
livers of hepatitis patients or cirrhosis patients, but, but this is very clear. You see the healthy liver here, you see the fatty liver there, and then you see here cirrhosis taking, taking place. And you can see how disorganized it is. You can see that there's, a, or you can imagine that there are a lot of, there's a lot of scar tissue and, this, and the material that's here, obviously, since we know the symptoms, is not very functional. And so, so you have a liver that's ginormous, but isn't isn't really isn't really helping that much. It's just a big lump that's in there, uh, not doing not doing what it what it's supposed to do. So, um, so cirrhosis. Much of the functional liver tissue is replaced by non-functional fibrous tissue that forms constrictive bands, disrupts flow, okay, which can you know push back that that uh, portal portal hypertension. So manifestations from asymptomatic to complete liver failure. That's the manifestations of cirrhosis. So you may not notice it. The liver may be trying to replace liver cells as much as it can. It's part of the, uh, part of the enlargement, uh, the hepatomegaly. So it's trying to keep up, but then, uh, but then it, it can't. So weight loss can be associated with that weakness, anorexia, ascites, pain. So we've mentioned some of these things. Late is going to be jaundice. Now we can't we can't handle the simplest of things, which is which is to uh, manage red blood cells that are breaking all the time. We can't the liver can't even measure measure that or uh, manage that. Portal hypertension, so blood flow through the liver isn't happening. So you've got this backup. You have these this shunting, this esophageal varices that are being formed, uh, and then ultimately liver failure. So liver failure, the most severe clinical consequence of liver disease, you have a loss of 90% function. So this is just kind of a, uh, I don't, I don't really know um, all of the details about how that's, how that's determined, but, um, but it, but it makes sense. You've lost 90% function. That's a liver that, that can't, can't, just can't do its job. Okay. So manifestations reflect the synthesis, storage, all of the things that the liver does. Synthesis, storage, metabolic, and, eliminate, and elimination functions of the liver. All of these things that we've been talking about that the liver does are going to be affected. So that means there are a lot of manifestations. Um, hemologic disorders, anemia. So anemia can occur, thrombocytopenia, uh, coagulation defects, leukopenia, um, so lots of lots of things that the uh, that the liver contributes to that we're not that we don't always think about, um, but we should. So endocrine disorders, fluid retention, hypokalemia, disordered sexual functions. So decreased cholesterol, decreased steroids, steroid production, and steroids are also broken down. So you may have an increase in steroids as well. Um, so let's just kind of go through here. So glucose. So we know that the liver manages glucose, and so you could have hypoglycemic events. Proteins, we know that uh, it, it also produces albumin, so you're going to have hypoalbuminemia. You could have decreased coagulation factors. Remember, these, these clotting factors are made by the liver. Uh, it manages lipoproteins, so you're going to have decreased cholesterol. It's the liver's job to make cholesterol. Remember, you need cholesterol. You need cholesterol, in some cases, to make, um, to make hormones and, and for just cell structure integrity, which is going to affect a lot of things. So, I mean, if you if you don't have enough cholesterol, cells that require cholesterol are going to be to be weakened. Uh, bile salts, that's one thing that it does. It makes bile salts. So now you have impaired fat absorption. So not only do you have decreased cholesterol because the liver can't make the cholesterol, but you also aren't able to bring in bring in fats, um, absorb fat. So you're going to have a deficiency. So you're going to have fat in your stools and fatty, fat soluble vitamins. Remember, uh, fat soluble vitamins need, so you need to have fat in your meal when you take, you know, vitamin A, E, D, K. So, so because it's absorbed with fat. So that means that if you're not able to absorb fat because you don't have bile salts, then you're also going to be deficient in some of those fat soluble vitamins. So amino acids, you're not going to be able to uh, convert ammonia to urea, and urea is harmless. Ammonia is not. Ammonia can cause brain uh, symptoms, encephalopathies, uh, which, can, which can alter thinking, uh, 
coma, those kinds of things. Steroid hormones, increased aldosterone, uh, which can lead to edema and ascites, increased androgens. These things are supposed to be broken down by the liver, and when they're not, then they build up and they keep doing the stuff that they're supposed to be doing. And uh, and in this case, you can see that it can that it can lead to some real hormone hormone abnormalities. Um, drugs, you can't break down drugs when your liver is failing because that's one of the things that it does. It detoxifies drugs. So a lot of times if you are on a normal dose of drug, then and you if you have liver problems, you might have to take less of the drug because that drug isn't going to be broken down as quickly. And then of course bilirubin, which is uh, you're going to have a buildup of that uh, unconjugated bilirubin, which is going to show up as jaundice. Okay. Um, Let's, that's a lot for the liver, and uh, it's an important little big organ. So now we're going to talk about a little, little organ, which is the gallbladder, and we'll also talk about the pancreas. So remember, the liver is producing the bile, but it's the job of the gallbladder to store it, okay, until, until fats are detected in the GI tract, and then it squirts it out. So the gallbladder will, will squeeze, it will contract, and it'll push the bile out. The idea is that that's what allows you to have a large fatty meal a couple of times a day, okay? Not necessarily a fatty meal, but that's what we have. We don't eat all day, and the liver is kind of drip, drip, dripping out bile all the time. So it's constantly dripping out bile, the liver. We're talking about healthy livers now. And so the gallbladder collects it and says, hey, well, you know, thanks for the bile, but actually there's no food in here right now. And then when you have a meal, it dumps it all on it, okay? Or I don't know about all of it, but it, but it contracts and it dumps a bunch onto, onto the food. And that, remember those bile salts, are what emulsifies fat. So these fats would be in these big blobs of fat, and it emulsifies them, and it turns them into smaller droplets, okay? And then those can be broken down. So yeah, if we remember that, I think I mentioned it before, but I can't remember for sure. So bile salts found in the bile emulsify fats. That's what the gallbladder is doing, working with the liver. The pancreas produces a bunch of, en of enzymes, every enzyme. So just about everything that can be digested enzymatically, the pancreas is making an enzyme to do it. Amylases, lipases, proteases, nucleases, just anything that can be broken down enzymatically, the pancreas has something for it. Um, uh, so lots of different proteases that break uh, amino acid sequences in different places to, to make them as small as possible. So both of these enter through a, um, a common duct. Okay, so, the, so here's the liver making the bile and then the, the, uh, the gallbladder. So this uh, duct here and then the pancreas can can also squeeze its stuff into there. And so when you have one of these meals and you get a signal, the cholecystokine and the secretin, those kinds of things to tell these, the liver and the, or the gallbladder and the pancreas saying now, food is here now, stretching will do it of the duodenum, and then it squeezes the stuff in. Okay, so the pancreas produces a broad range of digestive enzymes. Both enter the duodenum through the hepatopancreatic ampulla. Okay, and so that's, that's this thing we see here. Okay? And that's kind of important because if the pancreas gets clogged up, it's going to cause a backup in many cases to the, uh, to the gallbladder as well. So let's first talk about the gallbladder and specifically we're going to talk about cholelithiasis gallstones. We're going to talk about gallstones and they're beautiful in this picture anyway. Uh, so precipitation of bile substances, cholesterol, it's about 80% of gallstones are cholesterol-based gallstones. So you can kind of imagine that it's going to be associated with increased fats, increased cholesterol. The liver is maybe trying, I don't know, but at some point it just starts dumping cholesterol and saying, no, nope, too much, too much to handle, and that will move into the, uh, into the bile. And, uh, and so it's associated with obesity. Uh, also, and I, and I keep forgetting to, uh, to check on the exact physiology of this, but women taking oral contraceptives who have had multiple pregnancies uh, tend to also uh, be susceptible to this. It's, it's uh, I'm sure, hormonal. Obviously, it's hormonal, but uh, I just don't know the exact 
exact pathway for that. So uh, calcium salts can also, calcium salts with bilirubin can also form uh, stones but that's only in about 20% of the cases, but it's, but it's still something to think about because we already associated calcium with, with, uh, with kidney stones, uh, but, that, but we can also sort of associate it with gallstones, what people mostly forget. People are always fine saying, oh yeah, calcium forms stones, uh, but what they forget is that it's mainly cholesterol that are forming stones in the gallbladder. So remember that, 80%. So factors contributing to the formation of gallstones, abnormalities in the composition of bile, well, yeah. Uh, stasis of bile, no, no fluids should not be, in general, fluids should not be static. They shouldn't just sit in one place, you know, unless it's like, you know, in the joints or something like that. Um, but stasis of blood can cause clotting, stasis of urine can cause stones, stasis of bile can cause gallstones. Okay, so inflammation of the gallbladder uh, can lead to it as well, which, uh, since we're talking about that, kind of acute cholecystitis, that is inflammation of the gallbladder. Okay, so, um, so it can get, inf it, or it can become inflamed as well. So gallbladder inflammation associated with complete or partial obstruction. So there, uh, there's where we kind of get into uh, to, uh, some, some stasis, some gallbladder or uh, gallstone formation. So inflammation caused by chemical irritation um, from the concentrated bile, mucosal swelling, ischemia, secondary to venous congestion, lymphatic stasis. So when when something stops moving and dealing with the uh, the fluids, the lymph, the the blood, the way that it's supposed to, um, that can cause inflammation of the of the gallbladder. So uh, concentrated bile, mucosal swelling, ischemia, yeah, venous congestion, lymphatic stasis. So gallbladder is usually markedly distended. So that pretty much means stretched. And so signs and symptoms, right upper quadrant pain after a heavy meal or alcohol consumption. So that's one of these things you could say, okay, well, right after I eat, I start getting a right upper quadrant pain. Well, um, remember with an ulcer, your pain goes away when you eat, and it's not necessarily right upper quadrant, but, uh, but that's something to kind of keep in mind. After a heavy meal, what do you do? Your, your gallbladder, and that's why it makes sense, your gallbladder contracts. So you have a meal, your gallbladder gets the signal, the cholecystic, cholecystic kinase, whatever it is, um, will, will cause, the, uh, cause the gallbladder to contract. The gallbladder contracts and you say, ouch, okay, because it because it's it's inflamed and it's and it's painful, so pain may radiate to the right shoulder scapular region, unaffected by change in position. Well, it's because it doesn't care about your position. It's more interested in in the fact that the gallbladder is there. It's inflamed and it's contracting, so it's, it's irrelevant to position. So something else to kind of keep in mind. Um, so elevated serum levels. So we we talked earlier about. Um, uh, alanine aminotransferase, so the ALT, ALS, um, or AST, uh, anyway, enzymes that are that are associated with uh, with the liver. So, so during gallbladder inf inflammation, if there's some kind of a partial or obstruction, then that can cause backflow and and uh, indicate damage to the liver as well. And so we see an increase in uh, in liver enzymes, alkaline phosphates, both are, both these are enzymes produced by the liver for protein metabolism, and um, and so we see kind of a uh, kind of a an increase in the blood of those, and that's an indication really that the uh, that the liver is damaged. So jaundice, vomiting, fever, all occasionally present with uh, uh, col col cholecystitis. Okay. Sorry, I'm sitting here looking at cholestasis. Cholestasis is a reduction or stoppage of bile flow. The word stasis, stasis, stationary. So uh, disorders of the liver can cause that, the bile duct, the pan pancreas, any, any blockage. Remember, you've got the, the uh, hepatic duct, the common duct, and then the, the pancreas starts to, uh, starts to kind of inject stuff into, into this as well. Okay, so this is the liver. I don't know if this, any of this makes sense, but you've got the liver. So all of these things are kind of uh, joined together. And so any kind of a blockage along the way 
can uh, can cause stasis or stoppage of, of bile flow. So it can be caused by stones, hepatitis, so if the liver isn't making the bile, then it's not going to move. Bile flow in the liver would, would slow down. Bile accumulates, forms plugs in the ducts. The ducts may rupture, damage more liver cells, and then you see the uh, the liver enzymes that can be that can be released into the blood. Uh, liver would be unable. So this is this is really moving on and saying you're really damaging the liver. So the liver is unable to continue producing bilirubin. So that means that um, this is this is interesting because increased bile acids in the blood and skin. Okay, so if you have this this backup. Okay, and, and the bile is not able to move through, then what can a lot of times happen is that bile can actually start to rupture, can rupture through the liver, um, any kind of backup backs up into the liver, and then you start having hepatic damage, and then you release bile into the blood. Okay, and bile into the blood means bile salts in the blood, and that can lead to, and I think this is an interesting symptom, but pruritus. So that's so it can lead to itching, and that's possibly from the bile salts collecting in the skin, which they're not supposed to be there, and that can cause that pruritus or that itching. Okay. All right. So that's the gallbladder. Now we'll talk about the pancreas. So acute pancreatitis and autodigestion of the pancreas. Remember the pancreas is making enzymes and usually it's making enzymes to break down your food and usually when it makes the enzyme it makes it in a form that's not active okay because we don't want you know you can't just make an active enzyme because the active enzyme will just start chewing up whatever's around it. So usually it's made in an inactive form and then it's activated a bit later hopefully, hopefully, when it's in the intestines where the food is, okay? But in this case, what can happen is blockage of the pancreatic duct can leave these enzymes trapped in the pancreas. And when they get trapped in the pancreas, they can then become active in the pancreas, okay? So that means that they don't care. They, they don't know where they are. They assume they're supposed to be breaking down whatever's around them, and so they will start to digest pancreatic cells. It's like, oh, okay, well, there's a lipid. We'll just break that down. Okay, and it just happens to be still in the pancreas and it's a pancreatic cell. So that's what pancreatitis tends to be. Uh, activated enzymes begin to digest the pancreatic cells. Severe pain. Inflammation produces large volumes of serous exudate. So hypovolemia, you lose, uh, you lose fluid overall in the blood vessels. And uh, these pancreatic enzymes, well, you know, it's it's uh, they're pretty non they're, they're they're not very selective about what they're breaking down. They break it down. They can leak then into the blood. So capillaries can be can be damaged. Leaks into the blood, and then you start seeing things like amylase, which is supposed to be you know pancreatic amylase. It's supposed to be breaking down carbohydrates in the gut, and you see that in the blood. Lipase is supposed to be breaking down fats in the gut, and you start seeing that in the blood as well. So areas of cell, cells undergo fat necrosis when triglycerides are broken down into fatty acids. Well, you know, that's what these lipases are supposed to do. They're supposed to take these triglycerides and then start breaking them down into fatty acids. Well, that's not so good because now we have uh, this taking place, maybe in adipose tissue uh, or wherever there's where there are fats. And then you have the release of fatty acids, and then the fatty acids combined with... Uh, Calcium, calcium from the blood deposits in them, causing hypocalcemia, and then you have these uh, these calcium fatty infiltrates that uh, that can be found. So calcium from the blood deposits in them, causing hypocalcemia, and the calcium is getting trapped. Okay, so so now it's not in the blood where it really needs to be for function. So uh, this it's acute uh, pancreati pancreatitis. Normally, in a patient, would just be you know it's going to be pain. It's uh, it's yeah, it's kind of the death and destru destruction that I'm talking about, but it is something that can that can be reversed, okay? Um, and uh, and and a person can recover and, and be okay. But but they uh, they're going to notice pain, nausea, fever, swelling in the in the upper ab abdomen may may happen. Now, chronic pancreatitis 
that is a different story. So progressive and permanent destruction, uh, signs and symptoms similar to acute, uh, but of course we're talking about chronic, and often have digestion problems because they can't put the enzymes in the duodenum, instead they're releasing it into the blood and destroying their own pancreas. Right? Um, and glucose control problems because of damage to the islets of Langerhans. So, so uh, insulin glucagon producing cells can be uh, can be can be damaged, destroyed, and so they're supposed to be controlling glucose. So now you've got a difficult time uh, controlling that. Signs of biliary obstruction because of underlying bile tract disorders or duct compression by tumors. So uh, now you have biliary issues because of pancreas pancreas problems. Okay, so so and we need all of these things to survive. Obviously, it's not uh, it's not that you can you can't just take out the pancreas and say, oh well, we gave it a good shot, and now we're going to take you out. You can't do that like you can with a gallbladder. So uh, because we need all of these things uh, to uh, to take place. Okay, so that's it for this section, part two.